So the next problems um, have us solve inequalities. Solving the first 10 problems and solving the problems between 14 and 23 shouldn't feel much different. The only variation in algebra when you're solving an inequality, a problem that has a less than or a greater than, compared to a problem solving a problem with an equal sign, is you have to know when an inequality needs to be flipped. Um, and an inequality only needs to be flipped if you have to divide or multiply by a negative to isolate the variable. So I'm just going to solve each of the problems. There are three forms of the answer. I'm asked to write my answer as an inequality, and that's what I'm going to get when I just isolate the variable. So in problem 14, part of my answer is going to be x is less than 4. This is expressing my answer as an inequality. Then I'm supposed to um, graph, and I took the time to graph this already. I put an open circle on a 4 because I don't have the R equal to, and I made an arrow going to the left, and there's a negative infinity out here. So I'm supposed to write the answer as an inequality. That's what the algebra gave me. This is what this is here. And then I'm supposed to sketch a graph, which I already had done, but I've highlighted it. And then I'm going to make the graph into an interval. And that's what I've written over here. The interval form of this, the graph goes from negative, it starts at negative infinity, it ends at 4. Double round brackets, infinities always get round brackets, and the 4 because of the open circle gets a round bracket. Problem 15, I'm going to isolate the z by dividing both sides by a negative 3. And this is exactly when I switch the direction of my sign. If I have to multiply or divide to isolate the variable by a negative, I switch the direction. If I add or subtract, I don't switch the direction. If I multiply or divide by a positive, I don't switch the direction. But if I multiply or divide by a negative, then I have to flip the direction of the sign. So this is my answer as an inequality. You'll see here I wrote the letter X when I should have written Z. Um, I won't penalize you for that on a test. I do it all the time. I'm just programmed to write X's. That's my inequality answer. For my number line or graphing, I'm going to put negative 5 on my number line. I'm going to get a solid circle. And because of the greater than, I'm going to go to the right. This greater than is right, less than is left, only works if the variable is on the left-hand side. And then for my interval, I start off, my inter I know my interval goes between negative 5 and, and infinity, round bracket on all infinities, the solid circle on the negative 5 makes it get a square bracket. Sixteen is a two-step problem, not that big of a deal. I'm going to add 2 and then divide by 4. Adding and subtracting never flips the direction of the sign. So I'm going to leave that greater than sign greater than. And dividing only say, switches the sign if you're dividing by a negative number. Dividing by a positive number doesn't switch the direction. So my answer as an inequality is going to be x is greater than 5. So this is part of my answer down here. This is my inequality form of my answer. And then I'd make an open circle on a 5, have an arrow going off to the right, ending at infinity. This is my graph, or my number line. And then here's my interval notation. My interval is going to have the numbers 5 and infinity. Infinities always get round brackets. Here the 5 gets a round bracket because of the open circle. So for each problem, I'm supposed to write three forms of the answer. The algebra gives me the inequality answer. Then I'm supposed to plot that, plot that on a number line and then create an interval from that. In problem 17, having the x on the right-hand side, not a good thing. I'm going to use the property that allows me to rewrite inequalities. And that property would be um, if you're switching the direction, of, uh, you're switching the sides, you switch the direction of the inequality. So this greater than 
are equal to is going to turn to a less than or equal to. And the rewrite, the pointy end is pointing towards the 3x. The opened end is pointing towards the negative 4. This is a good rewrite. Now it's set up nice. Um, having the variable on the right is not good for inequalities because it messes up my graphing. So to solve this now, I'm just going to do my two steps. I'm going to minus 11 from both sides. That's going to give me 3x is less than or equal to negative 15. And then I'm dividing by a positive. Dividing by a positive doesn't flip the direction of the sign. So my inequality answer is x is less than, negative, less than or equal to negative 5. On my number line, I need a negative 5 with an arrow going off to the left, going to negative infinity. For an interval, my interval is going to start at negative infinity, end at negative 5. The infinities always get a round bracket. The negative 5 here gets a square bracket because of the R equal to. Apparently, I, need, I did some renumbering, and I didn't renumber on my headers because this is the last inequality problem that we need to do. Um, so, um, I was expecting to go to 23, but we're stopping at 18, and then we'll move on to a new kind of problem. 18 is one of these um, bet between inequalities, and for these between inequalities, my goal is to isolate the variable. To isolate the, the x, because the 2 is added to it, I need to subtract it. So to get the x isolated between the signs, I have to subtract 2. If in the middle I subtract 2, I'm left with just the x. And subtracting doesn't flip inequalities. When I have these two numbers on either side of an inequality, I have to do the same operation to all the, the outside numbers. So I have to subtract 2 from both outside numbers to get my answer. Here, the 5 minus 2, because that's easy subtracting, that's just a 3. Negative 7 minus 2, those have the same sign, so I'll add them and keep them negative. So the inequality answer is negative 9 less than or equal to x is less than 3. On my number line, I put the numbers negative 9 and positive 3. Close circle on the negative 9 because they are equal to open circle on the 3 because not the or equal to, and connect the two numbers with a line. My line doesn't go off to infinity. And then for my number line, I mean for my interval, I put the numbers negative 9 and 3 down, square bracket on the negative 9 because of the or equal to, uh, round bracket on the, or on the 3 because it doesn't have an or equal to. And that's that kind of problem. Now, a bunch of function problems that almost have no partial credit. So we have to be really careful on these. Um, I've typed up stuff just so that um, we can get through the video a little bit more efficiently and so that what's, what I have is readable. So problem 19 gives me a graph that's just a scattered set of points. When a graph is a scattered, unconnected point, you shouldn't connect the points when you're asked to find the domain in the range. The domain, when a graph is just writ written as a set of scattered points, is just the x-coordinates of each of the points. And usually I write from smallest to lowest, but it doesn't have to be. So I just start plucking off my x's. There's an x equal to negative 2, an x equal to negative 1, an x equal to 1, and x equal to 3, and x equal to 5, and x equal to 7. So the domain that I have written down is just the x-coordinate of the six different points, written in the squiggly curly bra bra braces. Similarly, when a graph is given as a set of disconnected points, you shouldn't connect them to find the range. And I'm going to list the range the same way. I'm going to make these curly braces, and inside the curly braces, I'm going to put the y-coordinate of each point. Um, if there's duplicate y's, I don't need to write them twice. So there are two points that have a y equal to negative 2. In my answer for the range, I only wrote negative 2 once, 
and then there's a y coordinate of 2, a y coordinate of 3, a y coordinate of 6, and a y coordinate of 8. These numbers that I wrote for my range are just the y coordinates of the six different points. And I only have five numbers in my range because negative 2 was written as for two separate points, and I only needed to write it once in my answer. And then for the next four problems, they come in pairs. C and D give me the function name with a number in a parentheses. E and F, in the end of them, it gives me the function with an X in a parentheses and a number to the right of the equal sign. If the problems are written like C and D, the number that's given is an X coordinate and I'm asked to find a Y coordinate. If the problem is presented like E and F, the number that's presented in the question is to the right of the equal sign. That number represents an X and I want to find a Y. So for problem C, because the number's inside a parentheses, that represents an X, I need to find a Y. So problem C, I'm going to look for the point that has X equal to 3, and the answer is going to be the Y coordinate of that point. So part C is calling out that point 3, 6, it gives me the x portion of that point. It wants me to find the y. Similarly, part D is looking for a point that has an x equal to negative 2. Part D is calling out this point, negative 2, 8. The x is negative 2. The y is 8. The negative 2 in this problem is the negative 2 x of that point, negative 2, 8. So my answer is going to be uh, f of negative 2 equals to 8. So usually for these problems, I write the problem with the numerical answer. Had for part C, I just wrote six down. And for part D, I just wrote eight down. That's completely fine. E and F are asking me to find an X coordinate that matches to a given Y coordinate. So in E, I scan and I look for a point that has a Y equal to three. There might be more than one point with y equal to 3, but there isn't here. So part E, that 3, because it's to the right of an equal sign, is a y. I found the point that has y equal to 3. My answer is the corresponding x, x equal to 1. For part F, I find all values of x such as f of x equals negative 2. Part F calls out the point x equal negative 1, y equal to negative 2, and it calls out the point x equal to 7, y equal to negative 2. This number, because it's to the right of an equal sign, represents a y. And algebraically, I'm supposed to find the x's that correspond to that y. And those x's are negative 1 and positive 7. So there's no algebra to do, and those are probably, you know, two points each. So what, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and all of a sudden that's 12 points without any algebra. There's another bank of uh, problems that are probably 12 points without any algebra. So there's going to be a lot of um, hard to give partial credit on this test. Problem 20 is virtually the same as problem 19. It gives me a set of six points. Instead of graphing the points, it just writes the points. But there's no real difference between 20 and 19 when I go to answer the questions, other than the points are written not in graph form. So in 20a, it wants me to find the domain of a function written as a set of points. Just like if a graph is just scattered non-connected points, the domain is just going to be the individual x-coordinates of the points, separated by a comma inside these curly braces, and that's what I have here. I went in order, but you don't have to go in order. I could have said the domain is 1, 2, negative 4, 5, negative 3, and 6. That's a correct domain. When the points are, are scattered like that, the order is not important, but it makes it easier for grading if we write the numbers in ascending order. Just like the range um, in 19, that, that's how I'll find the range here. Because these are scattered points, the ranges are just going to be the individual y's, and I see y equal to 2, 7, 2, negative 4, 5, and 7. So there's two sevens, there's two twos in the y's. When I wrote my answer, I took that negative four for a y, 
first, that 2 and that 2, so I only needed 1, 2, that 5 for a y and those 7s for a y. Those are just the four different y's. I, didn't, I don't have six numbers in my range because there are multiple points that have the same y value. The next two problems, just like the C and D in problem 19, they give me a problem that gives me an x wants me to find a y. To find f of 2 or f evaluated at 2, I need to find a point that has an x equal to 2. So part C is calling out the point 2, 7 because the 2 in the parentheses is the x value. It wants the corresponding y value. This is the nicest answer for part C, but I could just write 7 or I could write y equal to 7. Those are all acceptable answers. If we're doing tests on Canvas, uh, I will try to make it so I can accept multiple answers as correct. Um, Canvas is really not the best um, software for grading math tests. Oh my gosh, if you're sp you have one space different than mine, it'll mark something wrong and then I'll if, if a canvas marks something wrong that's right, I'll just go and correct canvas. Um, anyways, uh, D wants me to find the value of F when you evaluate it at negative 4. D is calling out this point, negative 4, positive 2. The negative 4 in the parentheses is the X value. It wants the corresponding Y value. For an answer, I could just write 2. I could write Y equal to 2 best answer would say f of negative 4 equals 2. The last two parts of number 20, the numbers that are given are to the right of an equal sign, so those are y coordinates. It wants me to find x coordinates. So the verbiage, find all values of x such that f of x equals to negative 4. It feels like I should have the word find here, but I somehow I'm missing it. Oh well, maybe I'll go back and add that in at some point. Anyways, I need to find the any point that has a negative 4 for its y and give the x. And in part e, the point 5, negative 4 is the only point that has a y equal to negative 4. This is why I wrote x equal to 5 for my answer. For f, probably should say find all values of x such that f of x equals to 2. For part f, I'm looking for any point that has a y equal to 2. And there's two of them, the point 1, 2, and the point negative 4, 2. My answers are the x-coordinates of those points, negative 4 and 1. Twenty-one is essentially the same questions, but for whatever reason, I didn't ask you to find the domain and range of this yet. So 21 gives me a graph where the points are connected and asks essentially the same last group of four questions. So in this case, my A and Bs will be comparable to the last C and D. My C and D would be comparable to the last E and F. Um, this function I call H just to give it a different name. Question A says find H of 8. That means find the Y coordinate of any point that has an X equal to 8. That's going to call it the point 820. My answer can be H of 8 equals 20 or just 20 or y equals to 20. For part b, same style of question. So I'm looking for um, a point that has 0 and it's x. And my answer is going to be it's y. So I found the point 0, 4. That's the point that had 0 for x, because if a number is inside a parentheses, it represents an x. And my answer best answer would be h of 0 equals to 4. OK would be just to write 4. OK also would be to write y equal to 4. The last two problems, again, I probably should say find all values of x such that h of x equals to 8. Find all values of x such that h of x equals to 0. Uh, this part's correct and it's the part that I need. In um, question C, I look for any points that have y equals to 8 and this point, negative 1, 8, fits, it has y equal to 8. Also, this point, 5, 8, has y equal to 8. That number, 8, because it's written to the right of an equal sign, in function notation, numbers to the right of the equal signs are y. 
my answer is going to be the corresponding x-coordinates of those points, so negative 1 and 5. And then lastly, same style of question as C, except change the y value to 0. Find all values of x such that h of x equals to 0. It's calling out this point 1, 0. It's calling out this point 3, 0, because those points have 0 for the y, and my answer is going to be x equal to 1 and 3. I have a little bit of algebra to do here. Um, 23 gives me a function, and it asks me to change the variable to different numbers, or possibly to different variables. To do f evaluated at 3, I change the x that's given in the function f of x to 3, and then I do orders of operations. For an answer, I can say f of 3 equals to 1, or I can just say 1. You could actually say y equal to 1. Function notation and y's are usually interchangeable. But this is probably the best answer for 22a. For part b, I'm going to find f evaluated at negative 4 by changing the x from the 2x minus 5 to negative 4, and then just doing the orders of operations, do the multiplication, and then the subtraction. I can do that in my head. You can pull out your calculator to do it if you can't do it in your head. And that would be a good answer for part B. And then for part C, just like I changed the x to 3 in part A, and the x to negative 4 in part b, I'm going to change the x to x plus 1 in part c because there's an x plus 1 in the parentheses. This is going to give me, if I clear the parentheses by going 2 times x plus 2 times 1, it's going to give me 2x plus 2 minus 5. I'm going to combine like terms and stop. I shouldn't set this equal to 0 and do any algebra to isolate the x. 2 minus 5 is negative 3. And there's multiple ways I could write that negative 3. I could write a minus 3 or 2x plus negative 3. Both of those would be okay. Somehow I thought this part of the video was going to be short, but it's not. Um, the next three problems give me graphs and want me to find domains and ranges. And in problem 23, because the edge of the graph isn't marked with points, then I'm assuming the graph continues beyond what I can see. It continues, and because it's going off to the right as it's going down, it's eventually going to make it out to the far right edge of the x-axis. Because it's continuing down and to the left, eventually the graph is going to make it to the far right, left edge of the x-axis. When I go to do the domain, when these graphs go beyond the edge of what I can see, I have to extend the graph to figure out the domain. And this graph, it's going to extend um, left and right all the way out to the far left edge and the far right edge of my x-axis. The domain for this graph is negative to positive infinity because the graph, there isn't any place on the x-axis that I could stand on and look down and not see the graph. No matter how far I can go off to the right, if I looked down, down enough far and extended the graph far enough, I'd always see the graph. The graph doesn't have a right edge or a left edge. When I go to do the range, I need to find the bottom and the top. For the domain, I do left edge to right edge. For the range, I do bottom to top. And this graph doesn't really have a bottom. If I try to draw a bottom, the graph would eventually go beneath it. So the start of my range is at the bottom of the graph, and the ranges are y's. The end of the range is at the top of the graph, and this graph has a, a real top. 
This graph doesn't extend upwards beyond above that point negative one six. So when I go to write my range for this, it starts at negative infinity. I read from bottom to top. Infinities always get round brackets. It ends at the point negative one six. Domains have x's, ranges have y's, so I need to take the y coordinate of that point. And if the point is either an unmarked point on the graph or marked with a solid circle, we get a closed bracket. If it's marked with an open circle, we'd get a round bracket. Infinities get round brackets. Points marked with open circles get round brackets. Unmarked points and points that um, are marked with closed circles get square brackets. I don't know how well this is going to show up. Um, I learned how to make graphs with open circles. Let me autofocus because this funky color here. I don't know if it's going to get rid of it. Yeah. So um, for this graph, the domain will go, be, because both edges are marked, the left edge and the right edge are marked, I'm not going to get an infinity. I don't need to extend. And this graph right here, this this is the left edge. This is going to be the start for my domain. It's the left edge of the graph. I read from left to right, left edge to right edge, and I pick off x's. And this point right here is at the right edge of my graph. That's going to be the end of my domain. Points that have round open circles get round brackets when I'm writing domains or ranges and points that are marked with closed circles or unmarked points get closed brackets. So my domain's going to go from the point negative 313, the left edge of the graph, to the point 3, negative 5, the right edge of the graph, but I only take the negative 3 and positive 3, the x portions, when I write my domain. Round bracket on the negative 3 because of the open circle, square bracket on the positive 3 because of the closed circle. For the range, I need to find the bottom of the top of the graph. The point 2, negative 2 is at the bottom of the graph. That's going to be the start of my range. The point negative 2, 20 is at the top of my graph. That's going to be the end of my range. My range needs y's. So my range, numerically, the y-coordinate of the point at the bottom of the graph is negative 12. The y-coordinate of the point at the top of the graph is positive 20. Those are the numbers that will go in my range. Both points are marked with a solid circle, so both numbers get a square bracket. One more domain and range, and then we get to the increasing and decreasing. Ooh, that's too long of a video. So um, let me do the domain here. Both edges of the graph are marked, so when I go to do the, the domain, I need the left edge, and this, this point right here is at the left edge, so this is going to be the start for my domain. It's the left edge of the graph. The graph doesn't need to be extended beyond what I see because each point at the edge is marked with a circle. And this point 2, negative 5 is the end for my domain. I go from left edge to right edge, and I pick the x's off. The x-coordinate of the point on the left edge is negative 3. The x-coordinate of the point on the right edge is 2. The numbers in my domain are negative 3 and 2. The negative 3 point has an open circle, so I get a round parenthesis. The two negative 5 points marked with a closed circle, so I get a square bracket. For the range... I identify the bottom of the graph and the top of the graph. Pick off the y-coordinates of those points. So here the y-coordinate of the point at the bottom of the graph is negative 5. Up here the y-coordinate of the point at the top of the graph is 15. So my range is going to go between negative 5 and 15. The point that starts the range is marked with a closed circle, so I get a square bracket. The point that ends the range is marked with an open circle, so I get a round bracket. Two more questions. There are no algebra questions. Again, we're a whole slew of no algebra questions. Um, it's the increasing, decreasing maxes and mins. Um, I'm going to separate this graph 
into regions for the increasing and decreasing part of this. Find the intervals where the graph is increasing, find the intervals where the graph is decreasing. The first interval goes between the beginning of the x-axis and the point negative 4, positive 146. With double round brackets, my first interval is going to be the interval from negative infinity to negative 4. My middle interval goes from the point negative 4, 146 to the point 4, negative 109. I'm going to take off the x-coordinates of those points and put them in round brackets. My last interval goes from the point 4, negative 109 to the far right edge of the x-axis, which has an x-coordinate of infinity. I'm going to call that the interval 4 to infinity. Each one of these intervals, it's either increasing or decreasing. It can't be both increasing or decreasing. My first interval, because the graph, if I'm drawing it, I'm, my marker is getting higher as I move from left to right. The first interval is an increasing interval because if you're drawing this, your marker will be going up. If I continue tracing along, the middle interval, my hand finger is going down as I'm tracing. That makes a decreasing interval. And then this third interval, as I'm tracing along, my finger is going up. That's an increasing interval. So these three intervals need to be separated between those two parts. So for the increasing, the outside intervals, the interval from negative infinity to negative 4, and the interval from 4 to infinity are increasing intervals. Usually when we have multiple intervals in an answer, we separate them with a union symbol. And then the middle interval is the decreasing interval. For these points, the high point here is a local maximum. The low point here is a local minimum. So the coordinates of my local maximum point are negative 4, positive 146. And then these maximum and minimum questions came in pairs. First to identify the point, and then I describe what the y value is. The y value of that point is bigger than any y value of a point close to it. So First, I identified the high point, or the local maximum point, and then I'm going to write the local maximum was y equal to 146, which occurs when x equal to negative 4. I just use these words in with the numbers from the point. Next part, to find the coordinates of the local minimum, that point 4, negative 109 is the local minimum. And then its twin, or its paired up part, is to write the local minimum value. The y-coordinate of the minimum point is the local minimum value, and it occurs at the x-coordinate of the minimum point. That's everything for 26. 27 is the same problem, just kind of flipped over. Or a similar problem, just kind of flipped over. So it gives me a graph, wants me to find increasing and decreasing intervals, maximums, and minimums. So I'm going to separate the graph that's provided um, into three panels separated by the minimum and the maximum points. My first panel is going to go from the far left edge of the x-axis, which has an x of negative infinity, to the point negative 5, negative 180, and in my interval here I'm only including the x. The middle interval goes from the minimum point to the maximum point, only including the x's of negative 5 and 3. The far interval goes from the maximum point all the way to the end of the x-axis, which has a coordinate of infinity. Those are my intervals, and now I'm going to determine whether they're increasing or decreasing by just tracing on the graph. As I'm tracing along the graph in the first interval, my finger is getting lower. That's a decreasing interval. Once I get to the minimum point I, and I continue tracing, I'm in the middle interval. My finger is getting higher, so that's an increasing interval. And then once I get to the maximum point and keep tracing, I'm in the third interval, my finger's going lower, that's a decreasing interval. So for my answers, the um, increasing is just the interval from negative 5 to 3. Decreasing are the outside intervals, the interval from negative infinity to negative 5 and positive 3 to infinity. C wants the maximum point. That's the point that's kind of higher than any point around it. 
D wants me to describe the maximum value. And I just took that same sentence. I said the local maximum value I could say is y equal to 76, which occurs when x equals to 3. So if you looked at my answer to part D of 26, it would look just like this. They're the, kind of the twins to each other. And then E wants the local minimum point. That's the point negative 5, negative 180. F wants me to describe the local minimum value. I took the same sentence that I wrote um, for part question 26F and just changed the numbers. Too long, a uh, 36-minute video, but it kind of is what it is. So let me stop here and hopefully you can get these problems perfected.